the previous lecture <coughs> we saw how memory generally gets organized and also saw some details about the memory different classes of memory uh, not really I would say in a very systematic way okay if we saw a few things which are more important for uh, general understanding and from practical point of view good now we're talking about it we said that essentially it is the speed match between the CPU and the memory module which gives rise to this hierarchy of memory that is we talk about the type of memory which can interact with the CPU at the CPU's speed itself the one that is slower and the one that is further slowest okay so we are talking about that now before we go into the details of the memory there are a few more points we have to take note of what is that first is we always talk about say something like an 8 bit CPU 16 bit CPU and so on or 32 bit CPU okay now how the memory is organized with reference to these different types of CPU right does it mean that if you have an 8 bit CPU the memory must also always deal with 8 bit data because essentially when we talk about an 8 bit CPU what exactly we mean is internally the CPU process can process 8 bit at a time that is what the word says okay then if it if it is 16 bit CPU essentially what we mean is internally the CPU is capable of 16 bit processing that is processing 16 bit data as one unit now that may be so for instance you may be having a 16 bit CPU but the memory need not really have a word of 16 bit weight you can still have a word uh, okay the unit that is the word we call it loosely uh, that may be still an 8 bit size okay 8 bit size word that is a byte so generally what we say is the memory is usually byte organized now there is a specific reason for that okay <coughs> uh, now when we say the memory is byte organized which deals with CPU which is 16 bit okay class as uh, classified as 16 bit CPU then essentially a byte which is uh, one uh, 8 bit unit so two such bytes must be brought in here okay we are not really talking about what is the bus suite here it is meaningful if the bus is also a 16 bit wide so that in one go the CPU may fetch the entire unit of information it can process and then carry out the processing but then the memory may be byte organized by that what I mean is whenever the CPU needs it can always go and fetch less than 16 bit data also okay see that is what the uh, memory organization permits that is what we mean okay in other words we can talk about a low byte and a high byte together forms one 16 bit board okay now anytime this low byte can be separately addressed and then brought high byte can be separately uh, uh, addressed and then brought if necessary that is what we mean so uh, <coughs> we have this what we may call as the data size of the CPU and the way we organize on the memory side which generally we keep it as byte organized now because of this we have different class of CPU itself what is that suppose we will continue with this example of 16 bit CPU okay uh, as uh, indicated here it essentially consists of 16 bit word and uh, it consists of the low byte and the high byte this is what we have from the CPU n now at the memory n right suppose let us just take a look at this that's it's a byte organized memory which means the width of the unit of information that is addressable okay is byte wide then we can talk about 
this as location 0, location 1, location 2 and so on. Fine. Now, there are two types of processors. For instance, suppose this location 0 holds the low byte and location 1 holds the high byte. That is together these two bytes are needed for the processor. Okay? Now, location 0 has the low byte, <coughs> location 1 has the high byte. Now, this uh, particular one is called, yeah, uh, as you can see the low order byte comes first in the uh, in this location. This is the first location. No? So, the low byte, the particular thing comes in the first. So, this arrangement is called a yeah, low uh, <coughs> low order byte first, right? Low order byte first is called, and it's also known as little endian arrangement. Meaning, the processor is generally called a little endian processor. The one. That is, two bytes may come from the memory, then <coughs> whatever comes from the low, uh, the first location, that is location 0, will be the low order, the other one, right, will be the high order. So, then such uh, CPU will be called a little Indian CPU. Now, it can be the other way also, no. Instead of this, you can also have an arrangement like this, in which location 0, right, location 0 may hold a high byte and location 1 may hold a low byte. Okay, together still we have the 16 bit data. So, what we are talking about here is the memory organization, mainly because it is a byte organized memory and the processor is 16 bit processor. It is capable of dealing with 16 bit data. Now, this particular one this one obviously will be called what the high order of the byte comes in the first location no so that will be called high order byte first so i'll just write the <coughs> uh, simplification uh, the abbreviation of it instead of low order byte first what we have in this arrangement is the high order byte first and as you can see, this other one is called a big endian CPU. Okay, like this one is a little endian CPU. Here, this one will be called a big endian CPU. Okay, now both the types of CPUs are in use. For instance, I would like you to take a look at how Intel CPU organizes its data and how Motorola organizes its data. 16 bit data and then see which is little Indian and which is big Indian. Okay, you may see that for yourself. Good. Now, from the memory point of view, as long as it is a byte organized memory, what we say is it is going to hold one unit of byte which is addressable. Right? From memory point of view, this whether it is low or high does not matter because it is the CPU which is going to fetch this data and then proceed. On the other hand, in soft 16 bit CPU, if you have an 8 bit CPU, right? So, here also the unit of information is going to be just 1 byte, right? Okay, fine. Now, this is one point. Now, another thing is this is as far as the data part of it is concerned. Now, let us just take a look at the address part of the uh, CPU also, that is the CPU places the address and how this address may be used in say addressing the memory or choosing different parts of the memory and so on. Okay? We know that if we, with an n bit address, what will be that? We, the total address space will be 2 to the power n. Okay? That is we talk about the total address space. This also sometimes called just the memory map. Okay? 
the map of the memory, the total address space, this whole thing would be of size 2 to the power n, that is because of the n bit address. Okay. Now, let us uh, <coughs> draw a, a few sketches and then try to see how we may make use of this n bit address in uh, say addressing the memory. Okay. So, let us say, uh, I think I will assume for simplicity sake, for the sake of simplicity, uh, that uh, the address size is 8 bit. Okay. It is uh, okay. The same logic you can extend for 16 bit also. That is, we have address, let us say, from A0 to A7. Okay, that is, it's an 8-bit address. I am assuming a not to a7. So with this, what is it? 2 to the power 8. The maximum addressability is only 2, 256. Okay, 2 to the power 8. Okay, that doesn't matter. Now, let us see. Which I can go to maximum of 256 locations. Okay, that is what I can have on the memory side. Now, um, <coughs> supposing I take this uh, bit A7 specifically, okay, bit A7 and then use it as one of the inputs to the memory part. Okay. Uh, this can be an address input to the memory, this is just some memory, this can be one address input or it can also be one of the control inputs we are not really seen. Um, I will possibly introduce. Okay. Now, I will just call this something like an enable signal which when on the memory uh, chip or system whatever it is is activated okay for some work right if it's at the chip level then generally we call it as a chip enable input now this particular one only enables this memory chip and so for effective address i get one bit less now Right? It only enables means this block is enabled. Now, on the other hand, just see what I am doing. I will take the same thing, same bit input and then let us say I invert that and generate another signal which I will call as A7 bar and then have another memory say chip. Okay, which I give to the other, uh, the, it is chip enabled input, that is the chip enabled input, this is a chip enabled input. Now, what does this mean? Whenever A7 is 0, this will not be enabled, so this part of the memory will not be in use. Whenever A7 is, oh, okay, when it is 0, this is inverted and this will become 1. So, this is enable and whenever A7 is 1, this is enable whereas, this is not enable. So, at any time depending on whether A7 is 0 or 1, either this or this appropriately is enable. Now, the rest of them, okay, uh, A0 to A6. So, I, I can give it as an input. Okay, this rest of them that is A0 to A6, which of course are derived from here, okay, though so not shown specifically. The same A0 to A6 I may give to this also A0 to A6, okay. So, that of course is the address input. If 
fine. Now, when the memory chip is addressed, uh, of course, the other kind of signals like read, write, all those things also must be given. Not showing them here. When it is enabled, and then say uh, the appropriate control signal like read comes, it will produce the data. No, fine. That data will be going to the data part of the bus, and it will go back to the CPU. Okay. All right. That we'll just mark it. If necessary, we'll discuss or we'll leave it. So, the address input to the memory comes from the CPU and also the necessary control signals, read or write. Similarly, the data output from the memory, that one will be going to the CPU. Okay. Maybe I'll just show it here. Okay. So, this is the data part which goes to the CPU. If it is bidirectional, it may come to this and also go there. Now, we us not worry about the data part very much. And I also said the control signals are needed. So, let us not worry about that for our discussion now. Now, what is it I have done? As long as A7 is 1, this chip will be enabled. And as long as A7 is 0, this chip will be enabled. In other words, okay. Now here, the, for the total address space here, our n, uh, uh, yeah, <coughs> we have eight bit, right? So two to the power eight, two fifty six, we have, and a seven is the most significant bit. Fine. So for the most significant bit, when it is zero, means it is the lower part of the address space. When the most significant bit is 1, it is the higher part of the address space. That is, if this is the lower part, this is location uh, 0, okay, lowest part, and this one corresponds to the highest location, uh, 2 to the power n minus 1. Okay, in our case, it will be for 8, it will be 2 to the power 8 is 256, and so this is location number 255, because we start from 0, we go up to 256. So, from 0 to 1 location 1 to 7, that is the lower one, okay, this is location 0, same, okay. location 0 to 1 to 7 corresponds to uh, A7 being 0, right. So, this will correspond to A7 being 0, and this part will correspond to A7 being 1, fine. So now, this total address space we are making use of in this particular manner. Okay, this argument you can extend to any n bit. Fine. So you can see that apart from the address input to the memory chips, the same address output from the CPU can also be used not only as input to the memory, but also for specifying some control signals. In this case, we are using for enabling the part. And so, you can say that this location 0 to 127 is going to be accommodated in this memory chip. And location 128, that is the next one, right? Location 128. 255, that one is going to be accommodated here. Fine. Now, <coughs> let me, all right, uh, alternately, I uh, will just extend this logic a little further. On the other hand, instead of using A7, I am just extending, uh, instead of A7 and A naught as shown here. Okay. If I take two memory blocks or two memory chips as before, okay, instead of A7, just see if I use A naught here, use it for chip enable. 
and uh, invert and use that uh, this is a naught right and this is a naught bar inverted this I use it for chip enable and uh, if I use a naught I have used. So, a 1 to a 7. Now, see for yourself what is the difference between these two. We saw that with a 7 being 0, it is the lower part, a 7 being 1, it is the higher part of the total address space. Now, in this one, this is the address bus, just like what we had here. Now, we have two different schemes here. In this, the LSB is used. Okay, we can say that of these address bits, the MSB or most significant bit is used for enabling. Here, the least significant bit A naught is being used for enabling. Now, what is the difference between these two? Okay. When, when we said now the same argument, we said whenever A 7 is 1, this will be enabled. Whenever A 7 is 0, this is enabled. Same thing holds good here also. Whenever A naught is 1, this will be enabled. Whenever A naught is 0, this will be enabled. Right? When is it? Just take even a 3 bit address assuming or a 4 bit address let us say. Let us just do for a 4 bit address. Okay? When do you find? This is your A naught, this is your A 1, this is your A 2, this is your A 3. This in other words, this one is the most significant bit, this is the least significant bit. In the case of this A 7 will be MSB, that does not matter. Uh, okay. Now, just see what is happening. What is the next number? Next will be 1. The other number will be, I mean, <coughs> the next number will be 1 0. Then you have 1. Then have like this. What is the pattern do you see here? You keep seeing for every alternate code, there is the address code, this LSB keeps becoming alternately 0 or 1. Right? Now, what is the equivalent value in decimal of this? This is 0 in decimal. This will be 1, this will be 2, this will be this is 4, this is 5 and so on. So, whenever we say whenever alternate thing, you find that these locations addresses correspond to even addresses, whereas this correspond to odd addresses. In other words, right, this particular one memory block or memory okay, block or group will be corresponding to A naught being 1, which means odd. So, this is all odd locations will be here, all even locations will be here. Fine? Is it useful in some way? Yes, in some places it is useful. Fine. For instance, here, see? If you just see, all even bytes will be low bytes, all odd bytes will be high bytes, is it not? So, we can possibly store odd bytes in this, even bytes here and then make use of this scheme and then address these bytes appropriately is also useful. Okay? So, in other words, here what you can see is location 0 comes from this block, 
location 1 comes from this block, uh, the other way, uh, location 0 comes from this block, location 1 comes from this block, uh, the contents I have to say. The contents of location 0 come from here, the contents of location 1 comes from here, contents of location 2 like that. So, in other words, it is like uh, okay, alternate thing, interleave. Okay, interleave. So, this in fact is called an interleaved memory organization. Okay. Now, all this comes just because of the way you are choosing the address and addressing the memory part. So, this is an interleaved memory organization. And this particular one, you are talking about blocks contiguous addresses here, right? Contiguous addresses, location 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 127. So, you talk about a block. So, this kind of starting from MSB actually leave, uh, uh, leads to the design of memory by blocking them. So, we generally call each of these as blocks of memory, okay? So, you can call this as, uh, see, S1 must be 0 for enabling this. So, this is the low block and this is the high block of memory, fine. Now, instead of A7, if you choose some other, say A6, let us see, okay. Then it will be another block, okay. The same way, for instance, in so A0, if you choose A1, fine. Now, just see A1 is right here, you can see that. These two 0, these two 1, these two 0 and so on. So, then you are interleaving memory taking two locations. So, like this you can go on uh, doing, fine. So, that is about this uh, interleaved memory part of it. Uh, one thing I would like to <coughs> indicate here, yes, you see this A0 to A6, that is we have taken 7 bits and then the 7 bit code will have to be decoded. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, 7 bit correct, A0 to A6, so 7 bit and so 2 to the power 7, 128. So, that will have to be decoded here, okay. Whereas, here we take A7 and directly give as 1. Now, next we will uh, do one more thing. We will take A7 and A6, right? Just for example, A7 and A6, and then see what we will be getting out of that. Instead of taking only A7, if you take, I mean, that is A7 for chip enable. If you take A7 and A6, for instance, we will get like this, that is A7 is used for enabling this part of the memory, this block of the memory and A6 for the other block. Now, because A7, A6 both are being used for the chip enable, right. Now, obvious that when A7 is 1, this will be selected, when A6 is 1, this will be selected. Of course, when both of them are one, both will be selected. So, let us not worry about that now. Huh? So, because we are using A7 and A6, we are left with only A0 to A5 and that is what is being used to address this, uh, speci these two specific blocks. Okay? So, thereby we are, uh, our addressing range comes down, addressing capacity comes down. So, let us not worry about that. What I am interested in showing you is, in A0, AFA used like this, we can decode the entire A0 to AFA, that is a 16 bit and get 1 of 2 to the power 6, get A0 to AFA, there are 6 bits and so the addressing uh, uh, address space size will be 2 to the power 6 and at any time only one of this address will be selected, okay, fine, that is right. Now, A7 is used here, A6 is used here individually, whereas A0, AFA collectively they are used. In other words, here 
this A naught FI code will have to be decoded to get at the address. Whereas, here directly A 7 is given and A 6 is given. Now, you have to recall here once whatever I was talking about earlier. See, I was always talking about whenever you have a code, either you can uh, do a linear selection that is using one bit of this of the code at a time or you can use the entire n bit code and decode and get. So, there are two procedures we were talking about earlier remember that is use a decode procedure and make use of an n bit code or each one bit of the n bit code you use. So, that is what you are seeing here precisely. So, linear selection is used why linear selection I was also mentioning one bit at a time only one bit at a time that is why if you ha have a 7 as well as a 6 both are one. So, suppose you have a an address right let us say a 7 a 6 a 5 to a naught ok. Suppose you have an address like 1 0 whatever it is and then another address 0 1 whatever be the address ok a naught to f i and say another address 0 0 ok some address ok it is going to be referred to some specific location and then another one. Now, look at these four combinations specifically I we concentrate on a 7 and a 6. So, when a 7 is 1 a 6 is 0 this is going to be selected. So, depending on some code a naught to f i one specific address uh, one specific location in this will be addressed when a 7 is 0 and a 6 is 1. So, this will not be selected this will be selected and which specific location depends on that particular address a naught to f i whatever it may be 0 0 none of them selected. So, no memory location address now what happens a 7 a 6 both are selected ok both are selected sometimes it may be permitted in some cases it may not be permitted. For instance, suppose this uh, CPU requires an 8 bit data ok suppose this requires an 8 bit data an 8 bit data and if this memory locations are going to say output 8 bit data both of them ok here I am not showing that let us say that also is outputting an 8 bit data then what happens both of them will be outputting 8 bit data and the CPU is going to receive that means there is going to be a clash if both a 7 a 6 are 1 1 that is both are getting selected. Suppose uh, this is a 16 bit CPU assuming and these continue to give only 8 bit data then possibly I can organize this to give the low byte and the other one high byte in which case no problem. So, in some cases this combination is permitted in some other cases it will not be permitted so, anyway our point here is to note that the address lines can be used in both ways that is either you can have a bunch of address bits and then decode them and use them or use each one of those address bits and do and select different parts of the memory in a linear select manner. So, both the things are in use ok. Now, that is as far as the addressing part is concerned. Now, there is one other point which I would like to mention before I go into discussion of something else it is this when we talk about memory there are two things we may talk about one is memory system or subsystem as a whole ok and another one is the say the components in that say for instance memory chip ok that constitutes the memory subsystem. So, essentially the memory chips <coughs> for instance this may be a memory chip this is another memory chip and so on ok fine. Now, <coughs> together with these chips which hold 
the memory data, that is the data in the memory plus the controller all these things will form the memory system. Okay? So, the CPU looks at the memory system as a whole which consists of different chips. Now, suppose we have say a memory uh, system of capacity, we talk about a capacity, okay? capacity say 4 kilobytes, okay? that is a byte capital B is for byte 4 kilobytes. Now, there are many ways in which you may be able to organize this particular one. How? For instance, you can have 4K addresses, right? And each address is giving out one byte data. This is one possibility. The another thing that is 8 bits. In other words, what I am talking about is 4K by instead of byte, we talk about 8 bits. Or the other way, fine. The total capacity of it is 4K byte. We may have 4K addresses, each of one byte. The other thing is, you may have, for instance, 2K addresses, each of two bytes, or in other words, 16 bits. There are many ways in which we can organize. Or also, instead of 4K by one byte, we can also have 8K of 4 bits. Instead of 4K by 8 bits, we can have 8K of 4 bits also. Now, all these things well finally would mean from the CPU point of view 4 KB memory system that is all right. Okay. Generally, whenever we talk about capacity of the system, it will be indicated in terms of so many bytes. Whereas, when it com comes to talking about the capacity of the chip at the chip level, generally it is at the bit level, which is what you would find in the data sheets. Okay? So, whenever you see capacity at the system, it will be done at the byte level. For instance, we can say, right, uh, suppose we have uh, a chip of uh, 1 kilo bits, okay? 1 kilo bits, 1 kilo bits, then it means basically, suppose we have a chip of capacity 1 kilo bits. And we want using this chip, we want to construct a memory system of 4 kilobytes. So, from this you can see, we do not know <laughs> here this 1 kilobits how it is organized, we have got to see basically. Possibly, uh, it is organized like okay, 1 k, no, there are 256 locations of 4 bits each. Let us assume, here also there can be many variation. For instance, you can also have 1 k of 1 bit also, it is also possible, right? Anything is possible, right? If I have 2, this particular chip capacity is 1 k bits, which is actually 2, 256 by 4 bits, basically it means this chip has 256 locations. From each location, I can get the data of size 4 bits. Now, if using this chip, I want to construct 4 kilobyte memory system. So, here I need a byte organized memory and so, for byte organization, I need 2 such chips. Okay? With the 2 such chips, I will get 8 bit output, which is a byte output. So, with 2 such chips, I only have as many as 256 locations and what do I want? I want 4 kilo locations. So, 256 into 4 will be 1 kb. That means, with 8 chips I can get 1 kb. So, 8 into 4 with 32 chips, right? 32 chips of that 
I can have with 32 chips, I can have this memory system of 4 KB, fine. So, this is what uh, <coughs> we have to remember. Whenever we talk about the chip, it, it will usually be referred to in terms of bits and whenever we talk about system, it will be in terms of bytes and the memory system may be organized in many ways. The same way, chips also <coughs> may be giving output of different sizes, right. Good. So, 32 chips are there in this particular memory system. Fine. I think that is about the CPU memory interaction. Now, we will go into some detail about whatever we had talked about earlier. Uh, the CPU always addresses directly, I said earlier okay, in the previous lecture, the CPU addresses directly the one part of memory which will be the fastest one because then only the processor utilization is the highest. So, whatever we have been talking about is usually the one which is closest to the CPU. Okay? There will be other circuits which will be coming with other uh, parts of the memory system. Okay. Now, CPU always places an address and that address will be decoded and then the contents from that particular address will be sought first from the cache memory. Right? We were talking about it earlier. Uh, just to revise, we were talking about three levels of memory, no? Cache memory, the second one will be the main memory, because the main memory usually consists of dynamic RAM, we also just refer it as the DRAM memory. And the third level of memory is not really memory, but it is storage. So, usually it is disk or MAC tape. Okay? So, I will just call it as storage system. Now, this is very fast. Because it is very fast, the cache memory will always consist of chips which will be very fast. Because it is very fast, it is always costly. And because it is always costly, the size of that also will be the least. Okay? So, just let us say we have 1 K of cache memory. Generally, we talk about when, is, when we say 1K, we mean 1K byte, okay? generally because it is byte organized memory. The DRAM, let us say, is 4K or 16K or something like that. And here, it can be more also, okay, just arbitrarily I am talking about. Here, it may be some mega or giga and so on, so forth. Okay? So, in terms of mega or giga, we talk about whatever it is. So, the CPU addresses the memory and looks for whether, uh, well, uh, when we talk about a program, what is the program address? That would correspond to the address of the CPU, whatever the CPU can handle. Okay. Let us assume the CPU has a 20 bit address. The 20 bit address will correspond to 2 to the power 20 that is 1 mega. Okay. So, 1 megabyte address, if you assume a byte addressability, 1 megabyte that is what the addressability of that. Right? Now, where is 1 megabyte and where is 1 k or 16 k? So, the CPU can address as much as 1 megabyte, but in DRAM or the cache we have far less space, which means <coughs> assuming uh, there is a program uh, which possibly need, need not be as much as 1 megabyte, but when the programmer writes, he will be writing, he, he knows that it is a 20 bit address the CPU can handle and so he will be generating a 20 bit address. Okay? but he does not know the internal uh, arrangements. Fine. So, a 20 bit address may be generated, but it will have to be translated into some lower uh, <coughs> size 
of the memory okay good which means assuming okay just assume there is a program of size 1 meg itself then when we have a cache when we say cpu uh, addresses or accesses only cache normally it accesses only 1k block so 1k of that 1 meg now it's possible that the cpu places an address and it does not find that particular data which it wants here because any time this is going to have only 1k of the total 1 meg so next thing the cache if that particular thing is not available in the cache the data is not available in the cache it will have to be looked for in the next level if it is not available there it will have to come from here remember that the cpu will deal only with this the cpu will not start looking for in the dram or storage or anything then what what happens if that happens what does it mean the processor utilization will come down is it not so there must be some extra circuitry right the cpu will look for this if it's not there some other circuit will take care of moving the required information the block of data from here to here so we always talk about <coughs> something like a block of data which or uh, uh, which can be moved from one level to the other level okay so now this block of data for instance here we are talking about a 1k block there okay a block of data <coughs> what is it which will be moved okay so this is the minimum unit of data this entire uh, one can need not be a block okay there is a minimum unit of data that is passed between two levels whenever something is not available okay uh, when we say that between any two levels okay normally <coughs> um, we will be having a different set of issues when we have when we have to move this uh, block of data from dram to cache memory or from storage to dram okay there are different issues here also. first we will take up this particular one so cpu looks for some data right in the cache it's not available then the cache must get that particular block of data from the dram agreed right this uh, <coughs> cache also will not be organized as 1k full block okay we will see that uh, we will see that when we discuss the detail okay suddenly a decision must be taken to see which of the existing contents in the cache can be moved away because when we say we have to move something from the dram then something must be moved out of cache right the same set of issues exist here also because essentially we have 1k and let us say that 1k is full but then cpu does not find what it wants in that 1k so something must be removed and then whatever is required must be moved in this is one specific issue the same thing holds good from here to here also okay so how this particular thing is organized we are got to see now as long as the cpu finds what it wants in cache then we say the cpu has hit okay that is cpu addresses and gets the data then we say this situation is called a hit when the whenever the cpu looks for the data it does not find it then we call it as miss that is the cpu misses the data or cpu gets the data and proceeds with its processing further and if cpu hits and gets it no problem but when cpu misses then there is a specific miss penalty time we are got to work out 
Now, this penalty associated with, with the missing must be kept as low as possible. Why? Then only the processor can be utilized well. So, we will go into these details in the next lecture. Thank you.